We'll probably have people continue to filter in, but to be respectful of everyone's time, we could get started. So first off, thank you to everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here today for the ISPD NAC Eastern Time Zone Journal Club. This is our second monthly meeting and uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day to join us. Uh, we continue to want this to be a really positive experience and low stress for all of our fellows and educational for all of us. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Sid Mehta. He is a second year renal fellow at Brown and soon to be a practicing nephrologist in New Hampshire. And he will be talking to us about hidden costs associated with the conversion from peritoneal dialysis to hemodialysis. Please note we are recording. Uh, and then I will mention this again at the end, but next month, instead of a journal club, we'll be holding a feedback session because we will be in the last week of June when a lot of us are in a transitional period. Uh, and because we'll have done this a couple of times, so it would be a great opportunity to hear how we could improve and your thoughts. Uh, so right now I'll hand it off to Sid and uh, thank you again to everyone for joining. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Um, as Dr. Shah might have told all of us that uh, here at Brown, we are very much supportive of home hemodialysis and home peritoneal dialysis, and I'm so lucky that I have been chosen to give this talk today. So uh, I I just wanted to make sure the slides are moving. Uh, right, Dr. Shah, is it moving? Okay, great. Yep. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about an article which talks about hidden costs, which is associated with conversion from PD to HD. Uh, we know that from the last execution, uh, last president signed an order for advancing American healthcare, which has created significant amount of interest in, and also uh, to us and also the dialysis organization to keep patients uh, more towards peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis rather than in center hemodialysis. Uh, and we have seen a trend where the PD population continues to grow from 2008 to 2018. Uh, not only PD, but all the home, he, home dialysis modality. So from 2008 to 2018, in, in 10 years, the amount of patients performing home dialysis has doubled, almost doubled to now. Um, and we know that PD is right now the most dominant um, modality when it comes to home, home hemodialysis or home peritoneal dialysis. Despite that we see that a lot of patients are transitioning from PD to uh, in center hemodialysis. And uh, we have taken care of those patients. We all might have taken care of one of those patients and we know how uh, hard that transition is. Uh, they, uh, it is not only the, the healthcare, but it's also a lot of emotional uh, decision because initially they were completely independent. They were controlling their life and now they will have to go to a dialysis unit. Uh, closely as a half-time job. So uh, we know that the patients who were previously on PD are getting transitions to transition to other modality, but rarely ever uh, I've seen a patient who got transferred to home hemodialysis. And there were studies being done before which kind of talked about uh, this issue. Uh, this is a study which was done to know the predictors of transfer to home hemodialysis after PD completion. The data was uh, obtained from Australia New Zealand Registry, and out of them, about 10,000 patients um, who were on PD, they were followed. Out of them, about one-third patients uh, died, and uh, 1,549 patients got kidney transplant. Uh, about 2,915 patients got transferred to hemodialysis. Guess what? Only 156 got home hemodialysis. So the those patients who got transferred to home hemodialysis, uh, they were followed, and the positive predictor of this transfer was uh, male sex, obesity, and PD duration. So the longer those patients were on PD, they are more likely to be transferred to home hemodialysis compared to the patients who were performing PD from relatively shorter amount of time. The negative predictors included um, age. Uh, those patients who are already having difficulty with technique, like those patients who had multiple episodes of peritonitis from technique failure, those who were underweight, and those who had kidney disease from hypertension and diabetes, and interestingly, race being Maori. Um, so the other thing which we see clinically a lot of time that 
the patients who were previously doing fine had multiple episodes of infection, and now we have to change the modality. So previous studies have been looked uh, this association. Uh, this was a journal article which talked about the impact of volume overload on technique failure in incidental PD patients. Uh, the data was op obtained from USRDS, um, and from those about 1,000 patients, uh, they were followed uh, and volume overload either at the beginning or at the six months uh, from the time patient was started on PD, those patients who had issues with volume management, they ultimately had high likelihood of having technique failure. And those patients are more likely to be transferred from PD to uh, HD, uh, especially in center hemodialysis. Now, uh, what about transplant, right? Because that will be the best uh, uh, solution for those patients who are already on PD. So those patients who are transferred from PD to other modalities such as home hemodialysis uh, compared to in-center hemodialysis, uh, 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 previous studies looked at who got, uh, uh, sorry, who got kidney transplantation uh, and who lived longer. So about 521 patients who transferred from PD to home hemodialysis, the survival for home hemodialysis patients were about 89.1% at first year and about 80.5% at second year. Uh, they were matched with those patients who got transferred to in-center hemodialysis and hazard ratio of death was about 0.76 meaning that those patients who got transferred to home hemodialysis were more likely to survive longer. Uh, similar trends were seen in patients who got transferred to, um, uh, who are, similar trends were seen when it comes to kidney transplantation, where uh, there is more likelihood that the patient will get transplant when they are transferred to home hemodialysis. Uh, this data was also obtained from USRDS. Uh, and, uh, now, surprisingly, uh, we did not have enough data to learn about epidemiology of this transition. As I told earlier, uh, this transition phase is very difficult uh, for patients. Also, it costs a lot of money to healthcare because th these patients keeps coming back to hospital with a lot of complications. Uh, so in this study, uh, USRDS data was looked at and to know the characteristic of patient who discontinued PD and got converted to hemodialysis, uh, or those patients who got discontinued PD due to death, or those patients who got discontinued PD due to they got kidney transplant. Uh, we also kind of uh, found out the trajectory trajectories of acute care rates, the total cost before they were transferred to PD and after they were uh, transferred to hemodialysis, and they were followed. Um, Patients' inclusion criteria was pretty straightforward. Uh, those patients who were diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease between January 1, 2001 to December 31st, uh, 2017, uh, age was more than 12 till 99. And uh, those patients had to, uh, patients who were diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease, they have to begin PD between the first year from the diagnosis. And those patients uh, need, to, need to be discount PD between January 1, 2009 to September 30, 2018. Uh, the reason for discontinuation of PD was either death uh, or transfer to HD or either those patients who got kidney transplantation. Uh, patients required to be on HD for at least two weeks. And if the interval of PD treatment were separated only by two months, then those interval were joined, means those interruptions were completely ignored. Uh, exclusion criteria was those patients who actually regained their kidney function. Uh, patient characteristic uh, stratified by event. Uh, this is table one. Uh, as you can see uh, that on the left end, uh, we have age, sex, race, preliminary cause of end-stage kidney disease, duration of end-stage kidney disease, how long they have been doing PD, and what are the other comorbid condition uh, which is associated. And we have data uh, to compare between those patients who actually were transferred to from PD to HD compared to those patients uh, who unfortunately died compared to those patients who were in uh, kidney transplant. Just by looking at the table, you can um, see that those patients who got converted to HD um, were actually 
younger than the patients um, who got, uh, who, who unfortunately didn't make it, um, but also they were older than the patient who got kidney transplantation. Um, and we can make other uh, prediction like black uh, race were more likely to be uh, found to have conversion to HD compared to getting a kidney transplant. Uh, shorter duration of PD um, were associated with more conversion to HD compared to uh, those patients who actually got kidney transplant. So this table actually helped us realize that if uh, younger patients, those with African-American ancestry, uh, those who did not do uh, PD for long term were more likely to be converted to HD compared to, to them receiving kidney transplantation. Uh, outcomes, uh, we calculate the incidence of hospital admission. Uh, this data was found from Part A Medicare claims, uh, their total observation stays, emergency encounters both before and after discontinuation of PT, uh, the amount of uh, the length of stay and the cost of healthcare, uh, which was covered by Medicare Part A, Part B, both before and after discontinuation of PT. Um, and this was uh, calculated for all those patients who discontinued PD and converted to either HD, either um, death or either uh, kidney transplantation, just to understand uh, how the characteristic of each different subgroup. Statistical analysis was done by using descriptive analysis uh, for all those patients uh, and a characteristic of each subgroup was compared. Uh, histograms were, uh, were, were used to, to estimate the distribution of age amongst the patient who discontinued PD, and also it was used to know the duration of PD uh, on patients who converted to HD. Uh, uh, estimated rate of all-cause or cause-specific hospital admission, all-cause hospital days, observation stays, ED encounters, and total cost of care during uh, the 12 month before and 12 month after the discontin discontinuation of PD were calculated. Um, in the post discontinuation phase, uh, the follow up was censored as early as discontinuation of HD, or they lost the coverage of Medicare Part A and Part B, or December 31, 2018, whichever one is earlier. In the subgroup of the patient who converted to HD, after three months of PD treatment, poison regression model was used to estimate the relative rates of all-cause hospital admission during the three months interval before PD was discontinued. Um, logistic regression model was used to estimate adjusted odd ratios of avoiding hospitalization during that three months of interval. And those patients who converted PD to HD, uh, cumulative incidence of PD resumption home hemodialysis resumption, death, and kidney transplant with follow-up ending as early at whichever event happened first or December 31st, 2018. Um, in this uh, study, that is, uh, we can see from 2001 to 2017, uh, about 19 million people were diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease who were more than 12. Out of those, about 274,000, so 14% of those patients uh, had uh, initiated PD by the end of uh, 2018. I want to correct it, 1.9 million, not 19, sorry. And 85% of patients initiated PD during the first year. So in this subgroup, the incidence of conversion to HD was about 21% at first year, 32% at two year, and 40% at three years, and 47% at five years. Meanwhile, the incidence of death was 8% at first year, 25% at five years, whereas incidence of kidney transplantation was about 5% at first year and 16% at five years. So in our study, uh, the cohort included about 124,213 patients because those patients who discovered PD were either from HD or death or kidney transplantation. Uh, the du duration of PD was heavily skewed. Uh, as you can see in this chart, um, about 44% of patients uh, were on PD for less than one year. About 23% of patients were uh, on PD from one to two years. About 14% of patients were on PD from two to three years. 
uh, 13% from three to four years, uh, five years, and only 6% of patients who were on PD for more than three years. Um, just a second. Uh, the distribution of age among the patient who converted to HD, uh, the distribution of age was uh, centered at approximately 60 years, where about two thirds of the patients aged from 40 to 70, uh, 40 to 70 years. Uh, the result slide, uh, table one, I, I know I've talked about this before, but here I just want to um, emphasize that the, uh, compared to the patient who discontinued PD, due to death, uh, those who converted to HD were younger patients. They were more likely to be black. Uh, they had lower comorbidity burden and they performed PD about seven months less than the other patients. And the, compared to the patients who received kidney transplant, those patients who converted to HD were actually older and they had higher morbidity burden and also performed PD for uh, about six months uh, or 5.5 months fewer. Now, going to the uh, table two, which uh, gives us a lot of information. Uh, so this actually talks about the rate of all-cause hospital admission, hospital days, observation stays, emergency department encounters, and total cost of care. Uh, the left side, where you can see months, uh, minus number represent before the patient were, was uh, discontinued on the PD, and the positive numbers are after they were transferred to the other modality. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, from minus six to minus one, so last six months of the patients who were on uh, before the patient was transferred from PD to other modality, there is a sharp increase in hospital admission. So uh, minus six months before it was 13 per 100 months, then about one month ago, it was 72. So almost significantly high number of patients actually ended up in hospital. After that, the rate did go down from 72 to 31.6, then 23.7 from 19. But I wanted to have your um, focus on the last, uh, the rate box, where you can see after seven months, uh, if you see the hospital admission was 17.3 and compare that with seven months before, it was only 12. And this trend continues to go um, uh, in the similar fashion. Like after 12 months, once the patient is on HD, uh, the hospital admission was 15.6 compared to 9.1 before. Uh, similar trends were seen in hospital days uh, and observation uh, stays, ED encounters uh, from what we have seen in the first, first uh, column. Uh, same uh, same uh, kind of trend. I just wanted to give one more uh, em time emphasis is on just what happens during the transition. So as you can see in the last one month to the one month after, uh, almost a lot of patients were in the hospital in last one month, about 72.1 uh, per 100. That rate did drop uh, once the modality was switched from, uh, from PD to HD. But if you compare, if you continue to follow those patient longitudinally, uh, before they were transferred, those patients still have very high likelihood uh, to be in the hospital compared to the time when patients were, were already on PD. Total cost this might be a good time to pause and chat about this a little bit more because I thought that this was a really uh, poignant table. I, I think that we all recognize that a transition from PD to HD is kind of a sentinel event and that there's a large increase in healthcare utilization, cost of care around that point in time. But I, I think that at least I had underestimated just how large that is. When you're looking at 72 admissions per 100 patient months, you're looking at a very, very high rate of admission. You're looking at a cost of care, which for our PD patients with Medicare Part A and B, your annualized cost of care is around 75 to 80,000 a year. We're looking at 20,000 in one month. Uh, just the staggering numbers that we're looking at here. And the other thing that I thought was really poignant was that while these numbers improve, they never return to their baseline. They don't return to your hospitalization or cost of care baseline at minus 12 versus plus 12. So I think that it's really important to look at this transition as a sentinel event and the 
uh, kind of both short-term and long-term consequences. And I think as home dialysis focused people, we, we really don't wanna think about transitions off of home dialysis. We wanna think of transitions into home dialysis, not away from. And so I was curious how others approach this kind of sentinel event and kind of decreasing the cost and morbidity associated with it. So for me, um, I, I also was surprised at the magnitude of the numbers as you were, but I, I think it highlights um, the poor job that we do. And when I say we, I mean kind of worldwide that we do transferring patients between home modalities. Um, and um, probably more specifically PD to HHD, but also the other way. But I, I think this highlights for me how we're not very good at recognizing in an earlier stage that patients who are not gonna do well in the long-term on PD and starting to talk to them and prepare them both mentally and physically for HHD. Um, and I think actually the percent of patients that transfer into HHD was actually not bad. It was over 5%, which in my mind is pretty good, but I think it could, you know, I think it could be higher because um, Sid kind of highlighted that like black patients were younger but actually transferred into, into in-center hemo sooner. Um, and it made me wonder, I, you know, that's probably a group that, you know, I, I think a lot of those patients probably could have gone to HHD, I'm guessing, but so that, that's how I looked at this data. I was surprised by the numbers, but I think we need to do a better job preparing patients who aren't gonna do well on PD and, and also vice versa, patients who aren't gonna do well on HHD and sending them to PD. Oh. Well, you know, I mean, I, I absolutely agree, Paige. Um, but, but maybe it's maybe it's the patient that uh, is the reason for the high costs and never coming back down to normal. I mean, maybe what's going on here is the people who are leaving PD in this study are really, really sick people with, uh, you know, um, um, uh, other problems, and and it's it they're the ones who uh, cost a lot of money to take care of, and and always. To, uh, and it's all centered around this transition driven more by the patients, let's say, the patient's illnesses. Agreed. I think there's definitely going to be patient factors as well as systems factors. Annie Claire, you had a hand up. Yeah, so uh, obviously that's a subject that I like quite a lot, but I think we need to remember that it's a mix of two types of patients. So we have these patients that we know will fail PD at some point because they're getting under dialysis and they have more complication, but they really refuse to transfer and they will only transfer really at the end when it's sometimes too late. And if we were able to transfer these patients uh, more in a planned way and take them by the hand, maybe we would be able to transfer them to home emo. And I think that's the group that we need to work on. But there's also a patient that get admitted because they have an acute health event. And then because of that, they cannot continue PD. And this patient, it's normal that they get on hemo because maybe it's not possible to keep on doing PD while they have this acute health event. But this patient may be able to go back to PD or may be able to later on switch to home emo or maybe they'll be too sick and we should think about what is their goal of care for the ongoing uh, steps, I guess. So it's it's difficult because it's such a mixed group of patient and we try to merge them together, but it, they're all different. Agreed. Uh, Scott, your thoughts? Yeah, actually I was gonna say a very similar thing. Um, you know, Paige, I, I definitely agree with you that we need to be better. And I think sometimes the fault is ours. I know when I have a patient who's potentially failing, I, I don't want to let them go from home therapies. And maybe I don't have that discussion as soon as I should, because, you know, I'd like to keep them at home and they want to stay at home when it's, you know, maybe in retrospect, it was obviously not a good idea. And yeah, I do think there's a lot of people who just have acute catastrophic illnesses or not, maybe not a lot, but some, and that could certainly lead to very high hospital costs and loss of uh, home modality. So that's about it. Agreed. Okay. I also Go ahead. would highlight, oh yeah. Oh, you can go. <laughs> okay, no, I was just gonna say to Annie Claire's um, remark about an acute event and also to what Scott said, it also highlights the need um, to have um, a better system in place for assisted PD. So that, um, and actually I was just talking about this in the last meeting we had that 
you know, uh, one of the big reasons in our organization that patients leave PD and go to instant or hemo is because they have an acute event and they lose the ability to do self-care PD. But since we don't have assisted PD in the United States, those patients really have no choice, you know, unless they can actually, they're wealthy enough to pay for someone to come and help them, but that's unusual. So it sort of highlights that as well. Agreed. Yeah, and uh, I was just gonna add, in, at least where, where I live, uh, if you if you are on PD and you end up needing a rehab stay in a nursing home, we just don't have a facility for that. I know some places do, but if, here, if you go into a, a nursing home, you're you're off home dialysis. And I think in terms of home to home transitions, particularly thinking from the US to transition from PD to HHD, you have to have HHD available to you. And it's a very underutilized modality in this country. And when you look at the most recent surveys of graduating renal fellows, the number one thing they feel uncomfortable with in their training was home hemodialysis. And I know Joel is doing a lot leading uh, home dialysis university and expanding with the ASN to kind of remedy this but you're not going to be able to do a PD to HHD transition if you don't have the HHD available to you. And if you don't feel comfortable prescribing HHD, you will not have it available to you. So we have a lot of work to do and to transition from home to home, you, you need both versions of home. And more nurses. That too. <laughs> That's the other thing that makes it really hard because we have programs that want to start an HHD program, but you know, let's say they've got 25 PD patients and one nurse, who's going to take care of those 25 PD patients while yeah. the nurse is training in, you know, an HHD patient. So that's the other issue. Absolutely. May I'll uh, bounce it back to Sid and we'll keep okay. moving through. Thank you through. so much for very uh, valuable input from everyone. Um, and now, going to the slides, which this is a supplement uh, data from table four, which basically talks about the rate of all hospital days before and after um, the conversion of PD to HD. Uh, obviously, these patients had Medicare and they were stratified by the timing of PD initiation, duration of PD, and the year of PD discontinuation. Uh, I want your attention on the red box again uh, to kind of emphasize as the patient's duration on PD increased from one year to about six years, the rate of hospital days in last month of PD increased by 21%. So I think uh, that to a point which was recently made that maybe uh, we need to do a little bit better job in identifying those patients uh, who are on verge to be transferred and maybe preemptively plan that, hey, I think we tried enough and I think this is the time for you to change the modality. And those patients are likely going to have more resistance as uh, uh, because they are so used to being at home and performing the dialysis with their comfort. So uh, just to add the point which was recently made, uh, I'm glad this slide was just next to the comments which was made. So now uh, this is table three, uh, which is adjusted relative rate of hospital admission and adjusted odds ratio of avoiding hospitalization during the three months immediately preceding conversion uh, from PD to HD and amongst the patient with Medicare coverage and more than three months of, of being on PD. So regarding the patient characteristic, adjusted relative rate of hospital admission during the three months interval before PD discontinuation were uh, modest in my although higher rates uh, among each less than 35 uh, compared to after 35. Uh, female sex glomerulonephritis, uh, polycystic kidney disease as a preliminary cause of primary cause of ESKD and the shorter duration of PD were associated with much higher adjusted odds of avoiding hospitalization, whereas black race and heart failure were associated with lower adjusted odds. So uh, I wanted everyone's opinion. How do they feel about this one? Because uh, I, in my, my experience, and I have very li limited experience compared to all of you legends in this field, but uh, heart failure is one thing I've seen a lot where those patients who were on heart failure, they ended up in hospital multiple times. So they might have higher odds ratio, but I'm not too sure about GN and polycystic kidney disease. So I wanted to start this conversation. What do you think, um, 
Dr. Shah, what is your take on this? So I think to me, my take on this are, uh, I kind of view these as populations where you will want to kind of focus your resources. So knowing populations that have a higher risk of hospital admission at the time of transition, those are populations where you can focus your social support and your uh, care team support. Uh, in terms of GN and polycystic kidney disease patients, they're, they're kind of a different me uh, mechanism of ESKD compared to diabetes. I don't really know what to do with people who are listed as having hypertension as their primary cause of ESKD. I think that essentially anyone who has hypertension listed as their primary cause of ESKD should probably be under unknown cause. Uh, but for patients with diabetes, they have a systemic illness that has resulted in organ dysfunction, whereas GN patients and PKD patients have a primary renal disease. So they're they're just a very different patient population, but this could help you target your resources. Uh, I'll let others chime in too. Okay. Oh yeah, we can keep moving. Well, I just, I just find it, I find it interesting that there's no effective age. I mean, I would just expect older patients to be hospitalized more often, but it doesn't seem to show that here. So that's, uh, that goes against, you know, what I would expect. Agreed. In fact, it was the younger who were hospitalized more, which is interesting. Did I don't remember from the article, um, did they, and I don't think they did stratify by ESKD diagnosis the reasons for hospitalization, did they? I don't recall seeing that. I don't think they did. That might be useful information, you know, like was it these younger PKD patients who were, had issues with pain control or bleeding, you know, or infection? So it might be helpful to know that. But. Definitely. Right, uh, moving forward. Um, this is figure three, which uh, causes about rate of cause specific hospital admission before and after conversion from PD to HD amongst the patient with Medicare coverage. So during the final month of PD, the monthly rate of hospitalization due to PD catheter complication increased sharp, widely outpacing any other cause of hospitalization. So if you can see the slide um, uh, 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 like next to the, the central line, the PD complication, uh, the reason for hospitalization from PD catheter complication is significantly outpacing any other cause. And once the transition has been made, um, I think cardiovascular disease takes the lead uh, after the transition has been um, made. So this kind of, uh, again, comes down to those, um, our problem by those patients who are more, more likely to have peritonitis, and then those patients will be transferred. So I think that's why we, maybe we are seeing uh, hemodialysis in center. Uh, again, we have cardiovascular disease trumping all other causes. Uh, this is figure four, which basically talks about the cumulative incidence of PD resumption, home hemodialysis, initiation, death, or and kidney transplantations among the patient whose reason of discontinuation of PD was to either uh, transition transition to in-center HD uh, was stratified by the duration of permissive gap between the discrete um, episodes of PD. So uh, if you look at this, uh, this graph, uh, the cumulative incidence of subsequent PD resumption was 11% at six months, 12% uh, at 12 months and 15% at 24 months. So not uh, not a lot of patients who actually left PD came back to the PD as the main modality of our dialysis. The cumulative incidence of home hemodialysis initiation and kidney transplantation was only three uh, three percent and seven percent respectively uh, at two months to uh, at twenty four months of inter uh, follow and cumulative mortality was seventeen percent um, at twelve months and twenty six percent at twenty four months. Um, so. Uh, I think to what I understand that maybe that there is a huge scope to transition these patients to home hemodialysis, given the fact that only few percent of patients were actually transferred to home hemodialysis. And that, again, goes back to lack of resources 
practices of home hemodialysis uh, nationally or maybe lack of education, uh, especially at the fellow level, um, uh, which kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, tell tell us uh, tell us the story where why we need more awareness yeah himesh has a comment i have a question about the previous slide uh it the internet kind of uh, was disrupting a little bit but did they specify the pd catheter malfunction what the reason was was it like infection related malfunction because we kind of know that infection and uf failure are like two most common reasons that modality switch happens. So if PD catheter malfunction was like infection related fibrin clots from infection or cardiovascular disease, which would like UF failure. So did they go into detail what the exact reason was? Uh, I don't uh, know if there was, if that was in a supplement, it definitely was not in the main paper. I don't recall seeing that in the supplements, but I will say I haven't looked at the supplements in about a week. Uh, I don't, believe that they went into detail about what the PD catheter related complications are. Okay. I also will say I found this a little bit difficult to read. I was trying to match up the colors oh. to what was which. Yeah. Uh, I thought carotinitis was lower than I expected. Yeah, I yeah, it would be very but I feel like yeah, PD catheter like I I would assume like so that if we know the exact reason maybe that's a sign that we need to intervene sooner to avoid all the admissions and costs we talked about earlier and what we had discussed earlier. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mish. And yeah, I do recall myself reading about the specific, uh, you know, rationale of what actually includes in PD uh, catheter dysfunction, whether it's fibrin, whether it's just, you know, UF failure, whether this is pure uh, peritonitis, uh, to my understanding. Yeah, I think, Oh, uh, we've got a comment from Annie Claire. Yes. So um, I think PD catheter may be related to early uh, stop of PD. So I think in, in that paper, a good proportion of the patients stopped PD within the first year and were transferred to hemodialysis. And perhaps this figure is based on the one month duration of PD interruption as a cause of the PD ending. So that may be real, that may be one of the reasons why the PD catheter uh, rate of hospitalization is so high. And the other thing is that for peritonitis, I think it doesn't include like when they stop PD and actually like switch. So perhaps we're missing a, a few of the uh, peritonitis hospitalization mm -hmm. specifically in that uh, figure. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. The I know we talked about this earlier, but I just wanted to highlight again that uh, the rates of home hemodialysis uh, initiation are quite low. Here we had 3% of accumulative incidents at two years. And particularly for PD, even for our patients who are transitioning to hemodialysis, less than 10% of that, or less than 15% of them are transitioning back to PD. So the decision to transition someone, and maybe this is why we see such a large increase in cost in healthcare utilization, it's one that we should think about in terms of long-term consequences, that when these patients transition from PD, that they are not going to be going back home uh, at a significant rate. I agree. Um, I mean, in, in most of the fellowship Place uh, fellows I talk with. I mean, the amount of uh, home uh, home dilation. Most of us has taken more care of PD to maybe uh, once the home hemodialysis takes uh, lead. I think uh, more of us will be trained to handle uh, this transition in the future. Yeah, I think we're having some internet related issues, but I think it's a important point that. Today's fellows are tomorrow's attendings, and if they're not seeing home hemodialysis, they're not offering home hemodialysis. Oh, and we... I think you're muted, and we may have lost your slides.
So I, I think we're having some tech issues, but we could just open up to some discussion then. Uh, I think to me, the, the largest takeaways from this paper were the durable impact of a PD discontinuation, the lack of PD to home hemodialysis transition, and the importance of the drastic increase in cost of care. And we've had a lot of discussions about that already, but I think it's one of the things that has been brought up multiple times is that there are multiple cohorts of patients here. There are patients who uh, kind of have a patient level event, a change in their clinical status and uh, transition off of home. Oh, we might have, are we, are we back up and running? Maybe not. Uh, so, I mean, there's kind of two cohorts. There's the patient who is an appropriate transition to hemodialysis, and then there's the missed opportunity for keeping the patient at home, be it a return to PD or a home-to-home -home transition. Uh, and so we've we've talked about that a little bit already. When you have patients who are starting PD, how do you approach discussing their kind of ESKD life plan? Uh, do we do a lot of us discuss that they will likely experience other modalities when they start PD. Uh, how do how do I would love to hear everyone's approaches to guiding patients through kind of the entirety of end stage kidney disease and these transitions. Can I say? So yeah. usually I will um, discuss several possible modalities, especially for younger patients. So I will upfront tell them that they could do directly home emo, they can go on PD. And if they choose PD, one of the option may be to change to home emo later on. Obviously, I don't say that to all my patients, but those that I think will have a longer uh, journey on kidney disease, then I do that. Uh, and then when they are on PD, especially those that are not available or are not candidate for transplant for number of reason, then after a few years, or if I see that for a different reason, maybe UF is becoming a challenge or clearance or, some, or other complication, I will discuss uh, the, the possibility of changing uh, to home hemodialysis. And usually I talk to them like, we don't, we have a shared practice, so I don't see the patient all the time, but every time I see one of these patients, I will talk about it. And sometimes it never happens because they get transplant, but sometimes after a year or six months, they, we, they will accept to change. And that being said, I have patients that have been on PD for 15 years and they're doing great. So I, <laughs> I don't want my patient to change, but I sometimes feel that we wait too long. So I guess that's my approach. Agreed. Joel, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, um, technically, uh, we're supposed to review modality with patients every year, right? That's part of the long-term care plan. And and uh, it's supposed to be more than, hey, you're doing okay, goodbye, you know, like they do in center hemo, right? So uh, so at, at a minimum, um, once a year, we're, we're pausing for a second and asking patients, how are they doing on PD and what's good about it and what's bad about it and have they considered you know, uh, uh, home hemo, or do, or do you think, would they be happier in center, et cetera? So that's what we're like supposed to do at a minimum. Um, but uh, like e even within home hemo, for example, if I have a patient on short daily, every three or four months, I ask them about nocturnal or, or if something is going on, but especially if something is going on with the patient, right? That, that in, in your mind trajectory, isn't as great as you think it, it should be, you know, start kind of early with the discussion. And, and it doesn't have to be one of these serious, you know, um, uh, you know, woe is me, everything is terrible. It's like, well, you know, why don't we just review everything that we have available to us and see what works for you, what happened, you know, where you are today wasn't where you were yesterday, you won't be too far tomorrow. So we just have to review these options straight away. Definitely. I think. An area of limitation, at least in the U.S. healthcare system, is uh, unfortunately for a lot of our patients, they do not have access to the full gamut of options based off of things like insurance, uh, immigration status. Uh, so that's a population where we do struggle with, at least locally, that for some of our patients, home hemo is not a possibility for them because uh, particularly insurance and immigration status. And so... I find that those are patients who I struggle a little bit with because I, as we're trying to 
discuss modalities and what is available to them, it's it's always a struggle when there isn't as much available to them. And similar to Annie and Claire, we do have patients who have been on PD for more than a decade who have done quite well. Unfortunately, we also have patients who have been on PD for more than a decade who have developed EPS and other complications. Uh, so there there is kind of the interplay also of the United States healthcare system and the lack of the opportunity for everything to everyone. And Joel, I, I fully uh, I, I fully agree with you that we should be asking people every year, but I know I can tell my own bias, and this is probably not right, is if somebody's doing well on home therapies, I'm not going to remind them that in-center's out there. But my in-center patients, I may ask monthly, you know, so <laughs> that's probably not the right way to go about it. But in, in practice, I'm sure that's what I do. Yeah. Yes, Scott, and I agree with you, but you won't know unless you ask, right? I mean, you're, you're making assumptions about how the patient is dealing with the home therapy, and uh, and that's why I always say it's important to an open-ended uh, you know, question, right? No, I, I agree with you. I just, uh, my, my practice is biased and I should probably change it. <laughs> I'm with you, Scott. My, my practice is biased as well. And I'm much less apt to have that discussion if I don't have another home modality to offer you. Uh, if, if the only transition off is to in-center, and that may be part of why our patients have such a high healthcare utilization around that transition. And we, maybe we were waiting a little bit too long and, uh, need to have that discussion more. So I also have a bias, but I, I came from an area where we do a lot of HHD, particularly nocturnal. And so I've had a number of patients who actually went from HHD to PD um, hmm. for any number of reasons. Um, and uh, you know how, much, how frequently you talk about it and how much you say to them, it depends a lot on what they were exposed to before. You know, Did they get pre-ESKD education? Uh, mm -hmm. Probably not, <laughs> based on uh, national statistics, but um, it, it, that does influence a little bit. We also do the training for HHD in the same area where we do the training for PD. So sometimes patients will see a cycler and say, what's that? And so that will mm -hmm. initiate the discussion. So it just happens to be the particular bias in this area that we have actually done more HHD to PD conversions than the other way around. But, uh, and and I I'm Scott too I I, I probably don't raise it um, as, I don't do as good a job as Joel does in, in terms of doing it <laughs> annually um, I will raise it when I see a whiff of a problem you know like a patient who keeps struggling with getting you know keeping their PD catheter flowing the way it should and I'll start to talk to them because I can see they're getting frustrated or the other thing is if I see the caregiver getting frustrated whichever modality is, that will often be a tip off to start speaking, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not as systematic as Joel, I have to admit. And that kind of reactive nature that a lot of us are describing that it fits the literature, if it's the literature of the complexities of this transition. And the other thing we haven't talked about um, which does, I think, play a little bit of a role, you know, as patients who may transition from PD back to in-center, we, um, we also don't talk to them not only about HHD, but about self-care in-center, mm -hmm. which in some areas of the country has led to increased recruitment into home modalities. And interestingly, self-care in-center, I mean, there's very limited data, but from what I've seen, it does lead to more, in a lot of places, to more HHD, but also to PD. So, yeah, we've we've struggled greatly with uh, suggestions and transitions to self care. We've we've discussed it with many patients and have met with a lot of resistance. But it it does naturally feel like a great way to kind of an in between a transition between uh, HD and home hemo for patients who we have identified as HD to home hemo transitions. We do try to transition them to self cannulation in center to kind of optimize that training period. But that's an area that at least we could probably do a little bit better and uh, maybe learn from you a little bit of how you actually operationalize it. So I think the key to that, and I'm certainly not an expert on this, is you've got to have the staff, you have to have the staff cooperating. If the in-center mm -hmm. nurse manager is not on board, it won't work. Because you need, you know, because I mean, any of us who have children and it, we know that it's much easier to tie someone's sho a three-year-old shoelaces than to teach them to tie their own shoelaces, right? <laughs> So I can see the parents among us smiling, 
So it is same thing. I mean, if you're teaching a patient how to use the machine, you have to have enough, you have to staff up in order to be able to achieve that. And, and so if your in-center nurse manager is not on board, it won't work. So that's been our experience. Paige, that's my question. How do you start such a program? Um, what, what do you, tips on starting a self-care program? In <laughs> you talk to your in-center nurse manager. <laughs> okay. It really it is. And, and then you start with one patient, just in like, just like we say, you know, if you're starting an HHD program, don't train two patients at once the first time, start with just one. And because, uh -huh. because typically what will happen, um, you know, is that one patient will have the machine turned towards him or her mm -hmm. and the other patients, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're sitting around, they're bored, they're nosy. What's that patient doing? Why can't I do that? So, okay. Hmm. But I, I always, I would say, start with the nurse manager okay. and work your way up to the AOD and the SOD. <laughs> okay. 